Welcome to this message from Alpha and Omega Ministries International. We value the Word of God as an instrument of growth in our lives, using it to mend our ways, align our thinking, and ultimately bring restoration. We trust that you will be blessed and encouraged by what we have to share. What I want to talk to you today is about restoring biblical foundations. And I will give a background to the message today, why I have decided to title my message as such, Restoring Biblical Foundations. And my opening scriptures are from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 46 through to 49. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 46 through to 49 from the New King James Version. Jesus is speaking here and he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which this, uh, the, the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. As we all know, foundations determine not only the height, but the strength of any building. And Jesus spoke about two kinds of people and two kinds of foundations. The one hears the sayings of Jesus and does them, and therefore builds his house on the rock. And the other, who hears the sayings of Jesus and does nothing, in other words, does not obey them, and therefore he builds his house on the sand. It is important to recognize that what defeats us in life is not what comes against us, but rather the faulty foundation upon which we are standing on. That is the determining factor. If we are hearers and doers of the word, nothing from the outside will ever be able to shake us or destroy us. We will stand the test of time even though we might go through some rough times, difficult times, trials and tests, we will remain focused, we will remain steady with our eyes upon the Lord because we have built our lives, our marriage, our families, our business on obedience to the Word of God. And as I am sharing this with you, Many years ago, before the crisis hit, I think it was, I think 2008, if I'm not mistaken, I had a very vivid dream. It was a prophetic dream. I was standing in the lounge of my house and I was looking at the harbor of the city of Cape Town. And as I was looking at the sea, the waves began to rise higher and each wave became like a, like a dragon. What we see in, in, in the movie sometimes, what do you call that movie that cars become robots? Anyone knows? Can you, can you remind me? Transformers. They became this great transformers moving towards the, 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 the harbor. And as they came onto land, they were devouring every building that was on the shore. As they came inland, I saw them in the dream surrounding my house all around. 
and I was running from one side to the house to the other side, declaring my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and rebuking those transformers in the name of the Lord. As they were about to grab my house and destroy it, I spoke the name of Jesus and they pulled back every time. That dream, it was so vivid, I will never forget it. Later on, much later, I realized what it was. And that's why if you are a hearer and a doer of the word, you don't have to fear any crisis, any economic recession, no matter what the devil throws at you, no matter what comes against you, you will be able to stand the test of time, you will endure, and you will triumph in every circumstance and every situation because you've taken the time not only to listen, but to practice what you know from the Word of God. Also, I want to share with you another vision that many years ago, while in prayer in the state of Florida, the Lord took me by the Spirit into, and I think I've shared that with you before, in a vision into this great valley. In that valley, there were many houses that were destroyed by the hurricane that came through that valley. And I asked the Lord, because every house in that valley was severely damaged. Roofs were blown away, walls caved in, foundations were uncovered. It was a dreadful, dreadful picture to see. When I asked the Lord to explain to me what I was looking at, the Spirit of the Lord said that the destroyed houses I was seeing in that vision represented individuals, families, marriages, ministries, churches, and organizations. And he said that because their foundations were faulty, they, they were not built on obedience to the Lordship of Jesus. They could not stand in the evil day. So when the storms of life came upon them, they collapsed. Then the Spirit said to me that there will come a time that he will send me to these houses with a team of builders to restore them. He then pointed me to a verse of scripture from the book of Isaiah in chapter 58 and verse 12. I want you to look at that verse of scripture because this is the heartbeat and the expression of this ministry. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to dwell in. As I mentioned, these very words from Isaiah 58 verse 12 express and communicate the heartbeat of our ministry. And you are part of this ministry. We are a ministry of restoration. Don't ever forget that. What do I mean by that? Those who align themselves to this ministry and continue to hear and obey the teachings the Lord Jesus gives us will experience restoration in every sphere of their lives. But the key here is to continue in obedience to the word, not just hearing the message, not just hearing the word, but putting them into practice. What you build, if you're a doer of the word, will last the test of time and you will receive rewards of your obedience, not only in this life, but also in that which is to come. And that is a promise from the Lord Jesus. The foundation of every successful and fruitful life is the foundation that is built in obedience to the Word of God. There is no other foundation. It is hearing and obeying every single day.
walking with the Lord, following the Lord Jesus, becoming a disciple and a student of the word of God. And let me say this and clarify the difference. There are two kinds of people in the church. The one kind is a believer. They believe in Jesus. They confess him as Lord. They believe in the forgiveness of the sins. They've been born again, but they haven't committed their lives to discipleship. Coming to Christ and receiving salvation through the forgiveness of our sins is one thing. But learning to follow Christ and becoming a disciple of Jesus is another. And that's the road that you're about to take, Ruan, to become a disciple, to learn more and more about the Lord and to adopt his teachings into your everyday life. We have many believers in the church, but only very few disciples. And the reason being is because discipleship costs. There is a cost involved. There is a sacrifice involved. That's why many choose not to commit their lives completely and surrender them to the Lordship of Jesus. Only those, according to the scripture, who have denied themselves and have taken up the cross daily, qualify to walk the road of discipleship. As long as self is on the throne of our lives, Christ cannot have his way. Only one person can live and express himself through you, either Christ or self. Amen? As long as self is on the throne of our hearts, of our lives. In other words, we, we are the government of our lives. Jesus cannot have his way with us, nor can he override our will to live as we please. He will never override your will. He will never override your choice. It's very important to pray. We have elections on Tuesday in the United States. Whatever happens in that country will affect the entire world. We need to pray that God would give discernment to Christians to vote according to the conscience and that the elections will be free and fair. And not only that, but we need to pray that the, the, the people will accept the results of the will of the people. God will not override the will of any nation. They have to choose who will govern the very country. Amen. That's why I say that Christ cannot override our will to live as we please. All of the learning in the world, cannot change us unless we are willing to submit to the Lordship of Jesus and be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is asking you for your will, your decision. He will do the rest. He's asking us to choose whom we will serve. If we choose him as Lord, the Holy Spirit comes to help us live the life of a disciple. He's not asking you if you have the ability or the power to live as a disciple, but he is asking us to make a choice. He will honor our will and our choice. And spiritual growth and spiritual development can only come through our obedience and surrender to the will of God. Amen. There is no other way. Spiritual growth cannot come unless we are willing to obey. James says in James chapter 1 verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Now let me say this, learning and studying 
the teachings of Jesus is not an end in itself. For many of us stop there, thinking that the more we know, the more blessed we'll be. In fact, the more you know, the more responsible you become. For to him that much is given, much will be required. So learning and studying the teachings of Jesus is not an end in itself, but a means to an end. Unless we are willing to put into practice what we are learning, my advice is stop, continue along the path. Stop, don't continue along the path of learning because the more you know, the more knowledge you have of the word and you don't obey, the more responsible you become. Are you with me? Because Jesus said to him, that much is given, much light, much knowledge, much revelation, much will be required. Praise God. So, the Christ life, the life of Christ, is a life of service, is a life of sacrifice. It is a life that is devoted and consecrated to the will of God and to the purposes of God only. There is no room in the Christ life for selfish dreams or ambitions. And there is no room in the life of Christ for self-preservation. It's important for us to understand that. Christ came into the world, the Bible says, to save sinners. How? By laying down his life in obedience to the Father. And the scripture tells us that he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And if we are his students, we must be like him. For as he is, the apostle John said, so are we in this world. We follow, we imitate God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We walk, we follow closely behind him. And if he denied himself, laid himself down in obedience to the Father, we do the same in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ by the help and the strength that the Holy Spirit provides us. It was Jesus who said that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So, let me repeat that. The life of Christ is a life that is consecrated, dedicated to God, and invested only in the interests of the kingdom of God, both in favorable times and in unfavorable circumstances. Not just when it's convenient, but when it's inconvenient. And sometimes the Spirit will inconvenience us to do things that our flesh does not want to do. For example, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Love your enemies. The flesh doesn't want to hear that. No, but that is a commandment, is not a suggestion. Forgive, regardless of what it's been done or said against you, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. These are commandments. They're not suggestions. Many Christians receive this as suggestions. The word of God says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Sufficient is the evil of the day. So when Jesus said, don't worry, don't fear, don't be anxious, it's a commandment. Amen. Now we're not going to discuss which is the greater sin, whether it's worry or adultery. Sin is sin any way you cut it. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Are you listening to me? So we need to receive the sayings of Jesus as commandments and not as suggestions. Amen? Are you still with me? Praise God. So, in order to partake of the life of Christ, we will have to give up our own life in exchange for his. That's the only way. 
This indeed is the life of a disciple of Christ. He has exchanged his life for the life of Christ. He laid down his life in order to receive the higher life. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The abundant life is what we receive when we give up our own life, our own dreams, our own will, our own ambitions, our own desires, and embrace the Lord's will. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. That's the life of a disciple. And we do that not just once, but every single day. Amen. And listen, this is not something, this commitment that I'm talking about, the commitment to become a disciple of Christ is not something you do in a spur of the moment when your emotions are high and stirred up or something you do in order to escape your problems because disciples may have more problems than those who are not being discipled. This is a decision you prayerfully consider for many days by counting the cost and the sacrifices you will have to make in order to pursue the will of God and the purposes of God for your life. This is so important. You prayerfully consider the cost because Jesus said, which of you who intends to build a house does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? So that when he starts, when he doesn't have enough, the house will be unfinished and people will look at it and say, well, this man started to build and left it unfinished because he didn't have enough. Count the cost. Count the cost before you make the commitment, prayerfully, willfully, your life will change. The power of the Holy Spirit comes upon consecrated lives, comes upon those who died to self and are alive unto God. God is not going to anoint people that are alive unto themselves. The anointing will cost dearly. Some of us will cost us much more than others, depending on the call of God on your life. And every single one of us is called by God. Not everyone is called to be a, a preacher or a teacher or a pastor. Many are called in the marketplace. Some are nurses, some are doctors, some are lawyers, some are businessmen, some are entrepreneurs, some are carpenters. And, and, and all, sort, all sorts of people, mechanics, computer experts. It depends on the call of God that's on your life. And if you're a disciple, you ought to know what the call of God is upon your life. Many don't know. And let me tell you, the reason why they don't know is because they haven't committed to discipleship. Because once you commit to discipleship, the Spirit will show you the destination of your life. He will show you the purpose, the gifting that you carry, and to what degree uh, uh, you will serve Him in the place that He's called you to serve Him. So if you don't know, well, I don't know, Pastor, what God called me to do. Well, maybe you have not committed to a life of a disciple. And I will tell you, the first place he's going to put his finger on is your family. We become disciples in our own family first. Amen. So, I'm not talking about salvation, accepting Jesus as your Savior, but I'm talking about receiving Jesus as the Lord of your life. There's a difference. I'm talking about your unconditional surrender to the will and to the purposes of God. That is a life that says to God, Lord, I will do whatever you command me to do. I will go wherever you sent me to go. I do not live for myself. I live for you and for the interests of the kingdom of God. That is the life of a disciple. Amen. 
I'm talking about your consecration to God and the investment of your life into the purposes of God's kingdom. Now, let me give you a broad picture of what most of the church is like in many parts of the world, especially in the West, where there is no persecution, there is no fear of being a Christian. This is the picture, okay? Please hear what I'm saying, hear my heart. I say that in love and I say with all the compassion I can master. We have become so obsessed with ourselves, with our own needs, with our own wants, with our own dreams, our own ambitions, that we have no room left in our lives for what God wants from us. If your life and your mind is so occupied with yourself, you have no room for anything or anyone else. Amen. In other words, we have become so earthly minded that we are of no heavenly use. The word of God admonishes us to set our minds on things above and not on things on the earth. Once your mind is set on things above, that is the interests of the kingdom of God. What is above? The word of God. What's above? Faith, love, patience. What is above? Generosity. Willingness to obey and willingness to do the will of God. Now, <clears throat> if we would stop and listen to most of the conversations around the dinner table or in our everyday life when we meet for coffee, we will understand why I make such statements. Amen. And even in the church, we preach a one-sided gospel. <laughs> we view God as this benevolent being who waits to meet our hearts, solve our problems, answer our prayers, instead of seeing him as the king of the universe who requires our submission and obedience to the word and to the will of God. Are you listening to me? God is not a genie. Yes, he will meet our needs. Yes, he will answer our prayers. But there is one condition. And that condition is if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of the things he said that we need shall be added to us. Added to you. You don't have to pursue those things the world pursues. You pursue the kingdom. You pursue the will of God. You pursue obedience to his word. And he will add to you everything you will ever need or even want in this world. That's the condition. But we turned it right around. And it, that's why it doesn't work. When I stepped out into the ministry without any promise of support from anyone, I asked the Lord, how? Am I going to take care of my family? He said, listen, you take care of my house. He said, I'll take care of your house. But his house comes first, not mine. Amen. In the beginning, God. That is the condition. You put God first. He will see to it that everything you need and want will be added to you. And not only that. Many in the church today seek the anointing, but not the suffering in the flesh or the dying to self, which releases the anointing of God. You want to be anointed by God? Then you have to die to self every single day. Not my will, but your will be done. And as I mentioned, God doesn't anoint people with his power that are alive unto themselves. God is not going to help you to fulfill your dreams. 
The Holy Spirit is not going to help you to do what you want to do. He can only help you to do what the will of God wants you to do. Amen. That's why so many of us are worn out. We're struggling. Why are we struggling? Why are we worn out? Because the anointing isn't there to help. And it's not there to help because we are not pursuing what's important to God. Are you listening to me? God the Father is calling us. And this is a renewed call from the Spirit of God to a life of discipleship. A life of unconditional surrender to the will and purposes of God. He's calling us, I believe, afresh to give up our way of living and receive His. And if we will prayerfully do this, He promises us that everything we will ever need will be given to us. I recall the beginning of my own initial commitment to discipleship and consecration to Christ. I was a few months old in the Lord. Minding my own business, running my own supermarket with my wife, going to church every Sunday without fail. I've never missed a Sunday, ever. No matter what, I was the first one there. Paying my tithes, never missed a tithe. Reading my Bible every day and praying for 15 minutes every single day. Until one day, I had a fierce argument with my wife in the store that we were running. I still don't remember what was about. I ran out of the store, very angry, got into my car, sped away on the road to Mutare. It was a beautiful sunny day, blue sky, not a cloud in the sky. And suddenly I looked up and I saw this huge white cross in the sky and beneath the writings, and Tuto Nika, that was the name of my first minister. Anna should remember that, which means in English, in this you shall conquer or in this you will overcome. I turned around, I drove home, I opened my Bible, and on the front empty page of the Bible, I drew what I saw and began to meditate on it. I wrote these words beneath the drawing. They're still there in my Bible, in my old Bible. You cannot serve God and self. Self must die. 47, 48 years have come and gone, and I have been dying to self ever since. Little by little, little by little. Every day, by the grace of God. Is it easy? No. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. I endeavored to walk the path of self denial, whispering to myself and to the Lord, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. The wife wants to do the garden that way. I don't like it, but Lord, not my will, but your will be done. The wife wants to change the color of the kitchen. She likes that color. I don't like that color. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. You know, at home is the best place to die to self and to surrender and to serve and to yield. No, you don't become a dormant because when you give up your own will, you receive Christ's will. I deny myself every day the right to be offended. And believe me, many opportunities are given to me to take an offense. I deny Myself, the right to be angry with anyone, the right to live my own life the way I want to or choose to. I deny self that right. I deny myself the right to keep a grudge against anyone. 
continuing to forgive, to release, and forget. And keeping my heart open to all people. Amen. I have come to understand, folks, in a deeper way what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, and I quote, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, verse, I think, 7 through to 12. He says, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live, notice that word, always delivered to death, for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. You want to produce life to others and for others? You're going to have to die to yourself every single day. That's the anointing. That is the grace of God working and living through you. Because you've denied yourself the right to live your own way. Amen. And here are my final words on the subject. Anything and everything that is not built in obedience to the word of God will be destroyed sooner or later. It will be washed away, burned up as though it never existed. The Apostle John said that the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Are you listening to me? So, as we prayerfully come to the table of the Lord today, let us remember, please, that Jesus died for us so that we could live for him and his kingdom. He didn't just die to forgive your sins and to heal your body. That's part of it. That's not all of it. He died for you so you could live for him and his kingdom. 2 Corinthians 5.15 And he died for all. That those who live, listen to those words please, with your heart, should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So as we lift up the bread and the cup today, we remember, we remember the sacrifice, we remember the death, we remember what he endured so that we could live for him. He died for you so you could live for him. So as we come to this table of the Lord, we receive the bread with thanksgiving. For Jesus said, take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in his blood, every promise. Drink all of it, he said, for the forgiveness of your sins. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We prayerfully consider all that you suffered. We remember what you went through so that we may live in your presence today. You brought us back to the Father for a purpose. There is a purpose in that, and the purpose is so that we may live for you in this world. Father, I pray 
And you can pray also. I will pray for myself. But I cannot pray that prayer for you. It's a prayer that you will have to make between you and the Lord after you have prayed for, prayerfully considered. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you every single day. I present my body to you every single day as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is my reasonable service. I determine not to conform myself to the will of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for receiving and accepting my consecration and surrender to you that is unconditional. Take my life, do what you will with it to the glory and honor of your precious name. Amen and amen. Thank you for listening to this message. For additional resources or more information about this ministry, come and visit us at alphaomegaint.org.za.